Hello, Baker Financial Institution students. So here we are, uh, March 21st, and uh, we're going into week five. So we are quickly approaching the end of the course, just three weeks left. So this week, uh, we'll get back into the forums discussion. So uh, jump in there early, get your initial post done early, and then uh, make sure to follow up to appear by Saturday and make a final post to appear by Sunday. So uh, in terms of this week, you're going to look at chapters uh, 17, 18, and 19. Um, chapter 17 really starts off with kind of the, the idea of the management of bank in order to make a, a profit, but it starts off with the concept of the balance sheet, looking at the assets of a bank from you know the loans, the reserves, um, the securities it holds to the liabilities, which can be, for example, deposits, uh, savings, CDs, or you know borrowings from other uh, institutions or the Fed or uh, other markets. So. But ultimately, banks are in the business of asset liability management. It's all about the spread. So um, you have liabilities, which you try to get at the lowest possible interest rate, to try to track those funds, and then you lend out at the highest possible interest rate that's still safe. So you, know, you have to take into consideration the, the credit risk of uh, other borrowers. So it's the difference between that spread, uh, in which they make uh, some of their profits, and which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more. It's that that traditional form of banking has become less and less, so there's other types of banking uh, activities that banks have to engage in now to be profitable, and uh, we'll talk about that related to shadow banking and other types of services in a little bit. So, But uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, banks this, week, this past week, uh, maybe some of you received a stimulus check, so... Uh, and uh, that definitely bumped up the reserves, but you know, but if they don't have enough reserves, you know, they can go out to the Fed funds market and borrow in that market to to meet that reserve requirement. So, but uh, capital adequacy management, uh, you're going to read about that. It's a concern because if you don't have enough capital, and all of a sudden you have a quick outflow of cash, and uh, banks have very long-term assets and very short-term liabilities. So. And after, especially so after the subprime crisis, uh, a lot of their you know, securities lost value. Um, they were negative in the capital requirements. So that's where they had to have the money by the federal government injected in the system to, to, to bail out a lot of the banks. So, um, so that's obviously a concern. Uh, you're going to look at performance management this week, return on assets, return on equity. That's going to be relevant for your uh, paper. So keep thinking about that, working on that for the long term. Uh, there are ways you can manage the capital. Um, some simple ways, you know, to lower the capital would be to pay out more dividends, do stock buybacks, uh, issue more CDs and loans. But if I wanted to raise the capital, I could issue more capital, more stock, uh, or I could lower the dividends. Uh, so those are examples. In terms of uh, off balance sheet activities, um, you know, other ways than the non the traditional ways of the spread I just talked about. You know, it could be fees, um, loan sales, foreign exchange trades, uh, servicing mortgages, uh, loan commitments, you know, bankers acceptances. They're usually used for trade to guarantee delivery of a import and export between two parties. You could have derivatives and uh, standby letters of credit. Um, you know, and uh, derivatives are the, probably the riskiest one. <laughs> well, they, are, they are the riskiest ones. You drive your income from some other line of security. So that's the the question of the, the trade-off and the, the textbook, and you may have watched the movie, I'm trying to remember the actor's name, but you know, it was about uh, uh, Nick Leeson at the, the Bank of England was taken down by, by hiding trades. So one thing, uh, whoever, if you're ever in the responsibility of management of, uh, within your company of funds or uh, within a financial institution, uh, make sure there's auditing and guidance and expectations, you know, so that's that it cost uh, the Bank of England big. But you're going to read about uh, bank performance historically over the years. Uh, you'll see some years better than others. Um, and then you're going to get into Chapter 18 with financial regulation. Uh, where's the problem again? The idea of asymmetric information, um, re the relative risk, you know, um, during the uh, Great Depression, um, that brought about a lot of reforms because you know people lost, put their money into banks they lost all their money but uh, you know especially from the, the the panics and trying to get the money out they just didn't have the money so one of the things to kind of alleviate that FDI insurance 
Um, basically, the textbook explains how it works, is that it can be where you liquidate and then the creditors get uh, what's remaining of the assets. More, the more common one is uh, a purchase assumption method where another bank takes over the bank. The government helps work it out. And um, kind of the, the, it's a partnership, if you will. But other ways that uh, regulation can be involved, the textbook is about nine of those there. Just some examples, restrictions on asset holdings, capital requirements, uh, charting and examination. You'll read about the camels, uh, the capital asset management, the earnings, uh, liquidity. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a good way that um, banks are reviewed to make sure that they are a, a sound financial institution. Uh, disclosure requirements, you know, the SEC, you know, um, accounting practices, mark to market, consumer protections. So these are just some of the examples in which banks are regulated. Um, you'll read about a lot of major acts that happened over the years. I remember when I was a, uh, did my exam for a certified cash manager many years ago. Uh, was, well, I use that more for treasury management, but also used for banking too. Uh, but two of the ones that I just kind of remember was especially the Deposit Institutions and uh, um, Monetary Control Act, Deregulation Monetary Control Act in 1980. That was a huge one because they got rid of the interest rate ceilings regulation queue. Before that, you know, banks like Citibank, you know, when interest rates were crazy, like 17, 18%, uh, the most they were allowed to pay was 12%. And they, they were going broke. So what, what happened is a lot of them moved out to places like South Dakota. And that's where South Dakota uh, became the credit card capital of the world for a while there. So, uh, but big one, uh, the, the other question too is the too big fail argument, uh, Frank Dodd Act. So again, additional regulation to try to prevent uh, bad behavior by banks. So last chapter, chapter 19, you're gonna look at banking industry and structure, kind of the historical, um, you know, the interesting thing about banking, you know, it's both state and uh, federal. And, you know, we had periods, you know, where there were just uh, even currencies were produced by like uh, a pharmacy, uh, you know, like a pharmacy, you know, so good for two cents, you know, so but uh, all kinds of different currency around. Uh, probably, you know, the establishment of the Fed uh, was one of the big ones and uh, the Treasury Department creating one common currency. Um, but, you know, in terms of uh, we have a dual banking system, both federal and state chart. But I'd say after the subprime crisis, the Fed has a greater reach and gear to control overall financial institutions and regulation. Uh, of course, the shadow banking system, I mentioned that earlier. A um, way to try to be innovative uh, financial institutions are always trying to create new products. You know, the credit default swaps were one that was a derivative, but it ended up being a big mistake because... Uh, companies like AIG, they're you know, issuing these. Um, we're making bets, you know, that the mortgage market would never fail. So, um, but, you know, some other ones that can be used is uh, adjustable rate mortgages, uh, hedging forwarded contracts. Again, you know, hedging can be good if it's to uh, hedge against risk. But when you're doing for speculation to try to make additional funds, betting, that's, that's when it can go really wrong. So, uh, but, you know, uh, credit cards are another way, too. Huge business for a lot of banks. Uh, I remember when I first finished graduate school, I almost went to work for a company out of Delaware, MBNA. I think my initial job would have been sitting behind a, a computer terminal analyzing, uh, issuing credit cards. Uh, but uh, I'm probably glad that I did not get that job. <laughs> Hopefully it would have led to other things, you know. But anyway, uh, there's electronic banking, virtual banking now. Uh, electronic payments. You know, it's really interesting too when I think about the different ways that we make payments today. I'm one that never carries cash around my wallet. Uh, I'm always paying with a credit card just as I always get the uh, the kickback uh, from my bank. But uh, there's also securitization of the uh, shadow banking. Uh, oh, I want to mention commercial paper too. That's another big one. I'm a market that I was involved in. I used to do a lot of commercial trading with commercial paper when I was at Sprint. Uh, it's basically how I got it through the week, but it, it's less than 270 days. Uh, that way it's not regulated by the SEC. And generally you have to have backup lines of credit. Uh, that's another way banks make money is they have backup lines of credit to issue to corporations in case they needed the money, but they charge fees for the right to have that money. But it's one of those things you really don't want to tap it because once you tap it, it kind of sends a signal to the market that, uh oh, that they're in trouble a little bit. So, um, but, you know, anyway, the securitization, uh, the mortgage-backed securities were a big example. Um, you know, we saw kind of the 
the disaster that happened after the uh, subprime crisis, but it was, it was highly, you know, involved in the banking system in different ways that uh, uh, loans were bought and sold and packaged together and sold off in tranches. But uh, other things too, they could have money market uh, accounts, uh, sweep accounts, which uh, corporations would have. When I was at Sprint at the end of the night, we would just have our money swept back into some type of overnight investment. So um, that could help uh, change the books uh, for the bank. And then treasury strips are another way. Uh, you can maybe sell them off, making them more attractive to individual investors, uh, making like zero coupon bonds, uh, do it at a slightly lower rate than the original rate on the coupon. The, the textbook examples have been exaggerated. We're going from 9.75% to the strips to 10%, but they're just trying to make an example. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it talked about it in the textbook to wrap it up, uh, the kind of the, the industry itself. You know, I remember when I started in the industry, gosh, there was probably about 20,000 banks. You know, the textbook authors say about 6,000 a day. Economies of scale and economies of scope have a big part to do with that. And the uh, in 97, I believe it was, when the allowing to cross, uh, cross state lines, uh, other banks did by, you know, creating bank holding companies. But I think we've kind of got to a settled down point where you kind of see regionally, uh, banks that uh, when you're doing your study, you'll notice that that certain banks have regions that they are dominant in. And that, that's something to write about, too, in your paper, too, to talk about that, talk about the history and also, you know, uh, where 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 do they do a lot of their business and what type of business. So, but, uh, and then you're going to read about you know, different thrift institutions and credit unions. Credit unions are slightly different in that they're, uh, your deposits in the credit union represent ownership so that they are not taxed. And that's always been a big divide between banks and credit unions is that credit unions have an unfair advantage. Uh, but so far, credit unions have always prevailed in the courts. So, all right, well, that is it for this week. So I hope you have a great week. Looking forward to you, the forum discussion again. I'll jump in there and um, join some of your posts. But uh, otherwise, if you have any questions, send me an email and have a great week.